All right, welcome to the Intermediate OBS Workshop. And I want to thank Carrie for getting this organized for us. And I also very much want to thank Sean and Jim for their part today, because uh, I'm just part of a team here. Um, as we plan this, this workshop out, uh, reflecting on what happened in the beginner workshop, um, what we thought would be best is to sort of demonstrate some techniques and, and ways to use OBS efficiently. Um, rather than try to work with an individual in this large group setting. That's why we're trying to reserve some time at the end for the breakout room so that if you feel like you're having trouble with something that I talk about, you can come into my breakout room. If you're having trouble with uh, somebody else's topic, you can go into their breakout room, okay? So um, I guess I should have brought home a second camera because one thing that's important to know in Zoom is that when uh, something <clears throat> when something grabs the camera, one piece of software grabs the camera, it's not available through another one. So um, I'm actually going to do some screen sharing here. <clears throat> and you may be able to see me from time to time, but um, not necessarily the whole time. OK, so you're looking here at my my uh, main monitor and my my obs window here and one of the things i wanted to point out is that it's a really good idea to have an some sort of an opening logo screen um doesn't really need to be anything fancy but just like before you start a presentation you keep your doors closed you may want to have something like this so that um you can can do things without having your camera um, showing your face all the time especially at the beginning before um, you actually start your presentation. Um, so that was created simply by going to the uh, creating a new scene, which you do with this little plus sign down here. And then once we, uh, I'll actually go over, I'm going to start a new scene collection here and demonstrate some of this stuff here. So I'm just going to call this workshop. All right, so there's a default scene which you could use or ignore or you could rename it. Um, you right click on it, it gives you the option to rename it. So I'll say just logo here. And then under the sources is what's going to go into that scene. This little plus sign down here is going to give us a choice of all sorts of things. Um, I'm going to choose an image. They can't use the, the name twice, so I have to call it logo image or something different. And then once I'm in this screen, then I can use this browse menu here to find the image that I want. So I've got our, our planetarium logo here that I'm going to select. And there we go. It's part of our scene. It's not really where I want it to be, so I can move it around and resize it here. Okay, and if I'm happy with it, then I can use the little lock symbol here to make that the final product. Um, another thing that you're going to want to have in your basic tool set is a scene that is just your camera. So I'm going to make one here, a new scene with this plus symbol down here called just camera. And once again, the stuff that goes into the scene, we go into our sources menu here. A camera is a video capture device. I'll name that onboard camera or whatever you want it to. And if you have multiple cameras, there will be different ones to choose from here. Um, I've actually got a couple of virtual cameras available, but only one actual webcam. So. When I choose that, once again, I, I'm going to need to resize that until I'm happy with it. Okay, but these uh, these can be building blocks for other things that you want to make. So I've got uh, got my basic logo. I've got a scene that's just my camera. Now, what's pretty pretty nice thing to do is that what's called that lower third, where you've got your name and maybe your logo across the bottom. So I'm going to make a new scene here called lower third. And one of the things that I want to use in this scene is my camera. Now I could just go here and um, choose the video capture device again. 
where it would give me the choice to, to choose the one that I've already added before, see that onboard camera that I named. But I wanna show a little bit different technique here because um, you may have multiple things in a scene and, and want them to, to be used elsewhere. So what I can also choose here is a scene, okay? And this scene that I'm gonna choose is just the camera. So if I had done anything to the just camera scene, like resize it or, or whatever, that would all be carried over as I bring that scene in as part of this new scene. And then the lower third image, um, because of time restrictions, I, I'm not gonna be able to demonstrate how to make it, but um, a lower third image is gonna need transparency. Uh, without transparency, this would be more difficult to do, but I've created um, an image here. So call that lower third. Oh, wait, nope, I already used that. Lower third image. Okay. All right, so I've got a uh, nameplate that I made for fun back in the early days of Zoom. So when I add that, now I've got another layer on my my uh, scene here. So again, here's the just camera scene and the layer. Now, if you ever wanted to rearrange things, that's what these little up and down arrows at the bottom are for. Um, so if I move that lower third image below the, the camera, then it's invisible because the camera um, is blocking it, but I can move that back up and, and show that on top of it, but only because this image is, has got transparency in it. Um, Okay, now another thing that I find very helpful in Zoom is, is uh, window capture. It says I wanna show other types of software that I'm using with my labs, with the students. So I'm gonna make a new scene here called Vernier, because I've got this Vernier software that I like to use. And, and let me show you, um, I'm gonna switch what I'm doing. I'm gonna switch over to the other scene or the other monitor, I, I should say. All right, so this uh, this Vernier software, it, what it's got is a little box that um, does live spectrum analysis. So I, this is just pointed at the light on my desk here, but um, when I'm using it with the students, it, it might be doing things like showing the spectral lines from an emission tube. Now. It's cool software and it's nice that it, that it shows all that, but honestly, it's it's actually showing more information than I want. Um, the kids, when they're, they're the, one of the problems with the software is that it shows wavelengths outside of the visible range. And that was confusing to the students because they would see peaks in this graph, but they weren't able to see them visually. So I'm gonna go back to my original, monitor here okay so here's my vernier scene with nothing in it yet so now i can choose a window capture again i gotta name it something different because it won't let me use the name twice and in this window we can we've got a menu where all the different applications that are running are visible so down here, Vernier Spectrum Analysis. Okay, so that's great. I mean, I was really glad when I discovered um, that I could even show that using Zoom. But again, with the wavelengths outside of the visible range, confusing the kids, I, I didn't wanna show all of the window. So here's a neat thing that you can do. If you hold down the Alt key while you resize it, it actually crops the image. So I can bring this down and bring these in and then, well, it's kind of small on the screen now. So without the Alt key pressed down, I can resize that to take up all the space available. But that cropping um, by holding down the Alt key has let me cut out the parts of the window that I don't want the kids to see. So that's a very useful technique. And I'm actually gonna show you a couple of different um, things that you can do with that, okay? Um, <clears throat> one point I wanted to make here was the advantages of having a dual monitor when you're, when you're uh, 
dealing with OBS. Um, so let me open up this picture here and switch over to sharing that. Okay, so what this is right now, this is a screen capture of <clears throat> both of my monitors. What you see on the right-hand side is my OBS monitor. And then on my left-hand side, I've got a number of windows ready to go for my show. And that's kind of a kind of what I'm going to go through with you next is, is a more efficient way to use Zoom or to use OBS with Zoom as you're giving a show. Okay, so the trouble is... Um, you know, if you wanted to use PowerPoint or something else, um, if you if you go into presenter mode, it takes over both of your monitors and you're not able to see your OBS window. Um, so a couple of tricks that I learned while getting ready for the, uh, the workshop here, I'll demonstrate for you. So going back to OBS, my, my first monitor here. Okay, so let's say um, let's say I wanted to use an existing PowerPoint presentation. You know, I, obviously there's other ways to handle images, um, but we've all got a lot of stuff invested in our PowerPoint presentations or Google Slides for that matter. So if I create myself a new scene here called PowerPoint, um, PowerPoint's actually kind of a pain. It doesn't always play nice with Zoom, nor does it always play nice with, with uh, OBS. But what I can do is another window capture here. Let me call this the PowerPoint window. And this time I'm gonna choose a PowerPoint that I've got open on the, the other monitor. All right, where is that? Hmm. All right, well, I guess I'll do it with my Google Slideshow instead. Same, same basic technique. So, you know, when we, we don't want to show necessarily our whole Google Slideshow because we've got our design <coughs> tools at the top, we've got our slide list at the side. We only want the kids to see the middle of it. So <clears throat> same technique, um, what I can do is crop this down by holding down the Alt key while I resize this. And yeah, you're gonna, honestly, you're gonna lose a little bit of resolution in here. Um, but you know, now what I've got is something where I can manually control my slides over on my other monitor. So using that design view, I can, pop around and uh, show all the images that were already part of my Google Slides or my PowerPoint. No, you're not gonna get the nice transitions that you may have built into it, um, but it's a quick and easy way to bring anything from an existing PowerPoint or slide, um, Google Slideshow into OBS. Now, um, OBS does have a native um, Slideshow tool built into it and before I show you how to do that, I wanted to talk just a little bit about getting organized ahead of time. So, um, where's my XN view window? Okay, so, so this is my, uh, my image browser that I like to use. There's a zillion of them out there, but across the top, you notice that there is um, a series of images here and I've got them renamed with a sequential number in the beginning. And I'll show you why that's important in, in just a minute. But one thing I could do if, if I didn't, you know, didn't even want to deal with a PowerPoint or a slideshow is I could apply the same technique with my image viewer. I could crop my screen to show just the, the image preview part. And then I could manually pop around and, and show the images in whatever order I wanted. Okay. But back to OBS. All right, so if I want to add an image slideshow scene, so I'm going to want to add my images. So we can either add an image or an entire slideshow. I'll just leave that the default. 
since it's not exactly the same as my other one. Um, so here's the issue that I found. This little, when you scroll down in the window to the area where you're going to add the images, it, it gives you the option to add files one at a time or add a directory, but it, it just got really cumbersome to keep going through that little plus sign and finding one image after another after another. But if I choose to add the directory, oh, so hold on, too much. So I can choose that, that uh, directory, which, oh, I see, it's not showing me the, okay. So now, now I've got all the images that were in that in sequential order, okay? So he's got these control, I'll remove that to the middle. Um, but we've got these controls here. We can manually forward or reverse through images. We can stop, make the picture go away. Um, and what's there's also a, a lot of interesting options here, um, either available when you're first creating it, or if you want to go back in and change it later, then you can choose the properties window here and do things like um, change what happens when you've got that scene open or not. Either pause the slideshow and resume where it was when you come back to it, or um, start and stop and restart. Um, the default is automatic, so there it was. It was cycling through the slides on its own. Maybe we want to use the manual mode instead, but um, lots of different options for that. Now. If I didn't want to add it as a whole slideshow because maybe I still was editing or, or something, um, and I go back to where I added the image, um, call this image show just so it's different. Then when I browse here, I can actually add the whole set of images by multi-selecting them. Oh, no, no. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm goofing this up. Yeah. Stand by. Okay. Here's where I wanted to go. All right. So in the image slideshow, that's what's going to allow me to add a whole series of images like this by multi-selecting them. And then if you wanted to, you could change the order with the up and down arrows. Okay, so, so there's many different ways to skin this cat, um, but it gives you some options for getting started. Okay. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt for just a second. Are you okay with taking questions from people throughout? Yeah, certainly. Okay. This would be a good point too, because I was going to shift gears in a minute. Okay, cool. So you all should have the power to unmute yourselves. So that's probably easiest to just unmute and ask questions. So Mark, as I'm trying to open sources, I'm selecting them just as you're describing them. But when they pop up in my active view screen, I see a cascade of the application I want to show with the OBS and you know OBS window in front of that, and then you know smaller and smaller uh, vanishing. Is there a reason that I can't just isolate one screen? Good question. Um... Well, that's part of why we put the breakout rooms into this. Um, perhaps a little bit later we could take more detail, but you're saying that when you hit this little plus sign down here and you choose what sort of source? Window capture. Window. And then I select the application. Oh, I called it PowerPoint, like you suggested. And mm -hmm. then I went and selected the PowerPoint window that's open. Mm -hmm. And then it shows the PowerPoint, but in front of that is the OBS controls, almost like I'm showing the desktop. And then it shows, you know, diminishing frames from there, just the same thing over and over again. Yeah, that's that's kind of weird. Um, awesome. that, that's wild. Is there any way that you could turn your virtual camera on and show us your desktop? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm trying to do that. And it, it, it it's just, it, it just shows me a logo of the uh, OBS logo and that's it. 
Oh yeah, you got a you got a in OBS. I, I know the solution to that. In OBS, you're gonna click the start virtual camera. <clears throat> so you have your virtual camera turned on in Zoom, but OBS it's not activated yet. Oh, there you go. You got it. Yep. Look at that. Follow me down the rabbit hole, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are you so, seeing there? Now so go back to the. That's what I get if I want to do my PowerPoint window capture. PowerPoint, and then there is my PowerPoint slide in the back. But uh, now I oh, see. Oh, uh, your is your PowerPoint minimized? Uh, no, it's not. It okay. Up oh, there, you go. I minimized it, and now it pops up. Awesome. So Fantastic. you kind of solved it, right? Yep. There you go. You have to okay. minimize your yeah. PowerPoint. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. I, re I retreat into the ether. <laughs> okay, so um, you know, just keep the, the the couple of things I showed you was how to how to have some images handy really quickly, um, uh, and how to deal with cropping windows. So what I'm showing you right now is my second monitor that the way I might have it set up when I'm going to run a, sh a live show. Um, I may want to go to Stellarium, so I'll have that window open. I may want to take um, have a slideshow of images that I'm going to talk about, and I may even want to have um, like a, a live internet browser window for things that come in. You know, we, we don't know everything. So what I'll do before I start a show is I'll, I'll have all these windows open and I'll set up a scene with capturing each of these individual windows. And that lets me be real quickly responsive to anything that comes in from the audience, um, back and forth between these. I, uh, and again, it, you know, having the ability to show people how we deal with, with finding new information, I think is good too. Um, now, one thing that is, I found really tricky about OBS was how it handles videos. Um, so I'm going to go back to my main monitor here and I'm going to make a scene called videos. There's two different ways to add videos in here. Um, one is this media source. Okay. If you choose that, um, you can just like we did with an image, we can browse and, and find a video. Okay, so here's one I made earlier today. All right, so that's uh, that's not me live. This is me talking to my star projector behind me. But let's get rid of that for now. I'll remove that and then add in one with a vertical video. Kid trying out for our virtual talent show had sent their audition video in as a vertical video and Look at this, OBS doesn't handle the, I think it's the EXIF data that tells it that it's supposed to be vertical. So what do we do about that? Well, there's another option for showing videos. If you have a VLC media player installed, um, you'll also have this VLC video source here. Okay, and if you watch here, if I show a little bit different interface of the window, but when I bring in that same vertical video, at least I'm right side up, but I'm not looking too good there, am I? So you may, I, I had to play with the aspect ratio and it's a little bit backwards. Uh, most other software, when you hold down the shift key that preserves the aspect ratio, but in OBS, the aspect ratio is preserved naturally. Um, and it's, it's, you can only mess with the aspect ratio when, uh, you've got the shift key held down. Um, there are filters that you can apply to a video. So if we click on that filters button, um, there is a scaling and aspect ratio filter where you could choose some different resolutions or different aspect ratios, um, although it's not free form. So, you know, this one, not the the mm -hmm. best example because it's it's still distorted there but just so you know that that's available and, and to be aware of it 
Um, now, last thing before I turn the floor over is one thing you notice about this is that you're not hearing any audio from my videos. We got to get rid of me there. Okay. And, and that's one thing to keep in mind is that while OBS is, is designed, you know, put my camera back on, OBS is designed more for use with streaming. And if you were sending your outgoing stream to a streaming platform like YouTube or something, it would include the audio. But when you're using OBS to deal with Zoom, it's not going to include the audio. Um, you would have, you could, if you were fine with it, you could just use your, um, your camera like you normally would with Zoom. If you want to bring in audio from the video, or maybe, you know, I had that web browser open and I wanted to play a video live from the web, you have to use what are called virtual audio cables. And um, I'll be completely honest, I realized that I didn't totally understand how they work when I started to prepare for this. Um, so I've got a document that I'm going to I'm going to send out through the chat um, as soon as I turn the floor over that gives you everything that I know about it and will get you up and running to share videos or your microphone or or live web videos um, and get the audio through. But it, the one thing I still have yet, the nut I have yet to crack is how to get it so that I can hear the video in my own headphones. So if anybody wants to improve on the document and tell me how we do that, great <laughs> okay but um yeah i think that it's really best for the virtual audio cables take a look at the document i did screen captures and spelled everything out as clearly as i could and uh feel free to contact me if you have any questions with it all right so let me turn the floor over to i guess um sean were you yeah i can go that? next I uh, thanks. For, uh, that was really good. I, I didn't know anything about the window capture. That was really cool. Um, so I'm Sean Gillette. I am the STEM coordinator for Apple Valley Unified School District. We're a K-12 public school in California. And our inflatable planetarium is packed away and I, I don't know when we're going to get it out. So I had to think of a way to interact with our kids. We've got about 16,000 kids. And um, we did some surveying and we found out that no one was teaching science. So we decided to become the science teacher. So last school year, we created a YouTube channel called AVUSD Storytime Science. And we had our high school kids read stories and then we recorded it. And then we paired it with the pictures in the books. And then we added activities to that. So the teachers could just show that and that would be their science. And that went really well. Well, this year we wanted to do something a little bit more. So we decided we were going to do virtual uh, assemblies. And so um, I'm going to share my screen now and I'll kind of walk you through how we did that and what we did. And um, we'll kind of go from there. Okay. Can everybody see? Let's see. There it goes. Okay. So um, this is how we set up our studio. I put a link right there. That's for this presentation. If you're interested, I'll also have that link at the end and I'll throw it in the chat so you can just click on it there. That's my email. If you have any uh, questions, um, I'll be happy to work with you. My OBS education started in October. I knew nothing about this and there are still large gaps in it, but I just kind of went crazy with it and had fun. So let's kind of talk about what I did. So I started out with uh, a webcam and Zoom. And I was terrified of Zoom bombings. So I would have the teacher run the Zoom and I would just kind of come in, but I wanted to do my own Zooms with kids. And I, since I didn't know the kids, I was terrified of that. So I, I had to think of a way to be safe with the kids. So what we ended up doing is I found OBS and I connected OBS, I you know, installed it on my computer. And I, I'll tell you what, I, I under, it's an underpowered computer. Um, I have to have it propped up with a fan on it because I kind of went nuts with all the peripherals I added to it, but I, it's working. Um, and then I added a webcam and a webcam and a webcam and a webcam. And I just kind of went nuts because I'm here by myself and I didn't want to be switching cameras manually. I wanted a scene all the way set up so I could just run to that camera, do my thing, run over here, do my thing and keep going with that. So then, well, we realized I needed sound and I'll be honest, I didn't know that you had to have a mic. I thought just the cameras did it. So we got a mic. 
Uh, bought this the day before our big show. I didn't know how it worked, plugged it in and it worked. Added some lighting, which I would not use shop lights. They're terrible, but that's what we had. And then I added some GoPros. And so I kind of went, a little, like I said, I went a little nuts with it, but um, we got it working. Um, I'll tell you the best way to learn OBS is through YouTube. And the trick is on the search bar, type in how to blah, 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 blah with OBS. And the community on YouTube is really robust. There's really, really good videos, better than I could show you how to do it. So that is really the key to everything I've done is how to blah, 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 blah with OBS. And I learned a lot from two sources. So the church community was using OBS and I learned a lot from watching their videos. Their videos were very welcoming to people. And that's what I wanted my channel to be is, is welcoming. And, and it was just a lot of basic, good knowledge. Uh, so I watched him, this guy was really good. And then on the way other end of the spectrum, I started watching video game streamers and how they did. And they do a lot of how-to videos. And so the video game streamers were really exciting. They, they're entertainers, they have sound effects, they have stingers, they have transitions. And so it was kind of two ends of the spectrum and I just kind of picked and choose what I wanted us to be. So this is our actual studio. That's me down there in the lower corner. I'm actually working on this presentation. I just did a screen capture. And uh, the lights you see, we borrowed that from the high school. The cameras we borrowed from the high school. Uh, we have some green screens going, we have a virtual background, and we ended up with two assemblies. We did one about uh, chemical and physical reactions, and we did a TK2 version for the little kids, and then we did a three through eight version for the bigger kids, lots of explosions, lots of mess, lots of fizzing. And then we did another one that we're just finishing up now, Science of Sound. And then we, again, we did a little kid one and a big kid version. Uh, and so we did, I think there's about 20, yeah, we did 20 uh, hour long shows of chemical reactions and we're at 18 with Science of Sound. And that's every Wednesday this year, that's what we've been doing. Um, so this is what my OBS looks like on the screen. So this is what we broadcast. This is kind of like our welcoming screen to the kids it, it, so they know where to land. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that background. It's, it's background there. In person, it looks terrible, but on camera, it looks great. We just bought it on Amazon. It was like $200. It's just a, a vinyl mat. We thought it'd be too, uh, too much glare, but it wasn't. Uh, that little box in the lower left-hand corner, I'll talk more about that. That is a uh, Elgato Stream Deck. It's a really great tool because I had to make a studio that was completely independent of a producer. It's just me and my wife in here. And so I had to be able to control the cameras while standing up and mixing hydrogen and, and blowing stuff up. Uh, right there in the very center on the table, that's a little uh, clicker for PowerPoint. And that's how we go through our, uh, our, our, um, our, our script that we have projected on a... Uh, on a monitor so we know kind of know what we're doing but again i have the scenes there uh the scenes you know have microphones attached to it and, and i'll kind of show you what we do and give you ideas and and honestly if you just use the technique of searching on youtube you'll learn everything you could possibly know about obs um so this is our other assembly this is me being an idiot uh we've got a little uh, genie in the bottle and that's uh hydrogen peroxide and potassium iodine and we started the show out with that. And so for this assembly, the chemical reaction one, we showed the kids chemical reactions and then we talked about the evidence. And then we had them uh, look at other chemical reactions. They had to prove it was chemical or physical. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was just, we started out with a webcam and these are cheap $20 webcams. And I'll show you what the webcams look like. They're really good. And we started with this. And then we graduated to GoPros and I liked the GoPros. They were a little more complicated, but they gave a better view. And then I, I didn't worry about putting a GoPro right up against a reaction and having it because it's a robust camera. If I was doing this again, I would probably want a DSLR, but I couldn't justify that because I didn't know what I was really doing. I didn't know what to buy. And so I just said, forget it. Uh, we'll just go with the webcams and the, the, um, the uh, GoPros. But the ultimate system would be something more like this, where they're on uh, motor, motorized mounts. You have to have a producer with this. You have to have the producer lining up the next shot. And then when you switch the next scene, then they take the first camera and line up the next scene. We didn't have that. 
so I had to have it all planned out, one camera for each, and it really lagged my computer. We had some issues with that at first, and I'll, I'll go over that. Um, so talking about how our system, like I said, we started out with a GoPro, and the GoPro is connected to my underpowered laptop, and that's connected to OBS, which now sends it to YouTube. Uh, and you, you do the, that through streaming. And what we ended up doing is YouTube went out to the teachers on their Zoom accounts. And then from the Zoom accounts, they interacted with their kids. And I didn't think this was gonna work at first and we tested it out and it, it, it did. So um, the kids had a lot of fun and that kept the chat all contained within the safety of that classroom and the teacher could monitor it. Cause I didn't know who was who, who, should I let this person in? Should I put this person back in the waiting room? I didn't know that. Um, when we started out, uh, I thought, hey, let's have these GoPros film in 4K, best resolution possible. But then what I found out was the computer would downgrade it to 1080 and then OBS would downgrade it to 720. And by the time I got to YouTube, we had drop frames and bad connections. And it just wasn't good for the kids. And doing a lot of research, I found that if I just decrease, oh, by the way, this is what the kids were watching. So why even film in 4K when that's their, that's their world? It's a terrible computer to begin with. So I ended up downgrading the GoPros to 720, and then it just stayed at 720 all across the board. And by the time it got to YouTube, it was an excellent connection, and we weren't dropping frames. And it actually looked better. So can keep in mind that sometimes by degrading your initial source, you're going to get a better result at the end. And I'll tell you, I've got so many cameras on this little laptop. I've got a USB hub chained to a USB hub chained to a USB hub. And so it, it gets really kind of ugly. And we're going to tear all this down in about two weeks and I'll rebuild it from scratch with the right stuff. I just, I didn't know. This is October. I was trying to figure it out, trying to do something, knew nothing about OBS. And I just started learning. I'll tell you what, if you do a studio, the lighting is really, really critical. There's something called lighting theory. I had no idea. Uh, you have to have a key light that looks right on you that's in line with the camera. And then you've got to have like a, at a 45 degree angle, a fill light. And then you have to have a light on your backdrop. And it took us probably a month to figure this out. And I borrowed the lights from the high school, actual studio lights that we could dim. And it made such a difference. We were, you know, we started out with, or this is what I... Uh, we ended up using. And these are super cheap. I mean, I think these are about $150 for a pair and they're dimmable and you can use the barn doors and they're just, they're nice soft lights because we were starting out with these, the shop lights, and it was awful, the glare and we couldn't dim it. And then we just didn't have a lot of options. So don't, the lighting is, a, is an actual thing and you can get really, really complicated. You can put a light over your head and have a hair light. So you get a halo around you, which works, looks really good. Um, and then we even have like an illusionary light in the corner and I'll show you that looks like it's lighting everything up, but it's just, it's just there for the effects. And I think high, uh, television shows do that a lot. Uh, the microphone, like I said, we used, uh, this is about $50 for a, uh, this is a, a blue snowball they're called and it's a USB mic. If I had to do it over again, I would do lapel mics because I have, you know, I have different corners in the studio that we have to get audio sources too. And I have a lot of cables running. And if I would have just done a wireless lapel, it would have been easier. Then I could have gone outside, done stuff, come in here, gone to the green screen, and I'd still be mic'd up where I just had to run lots of cheap microphones to pick up my voice. I, I didn't know. Uh, I'll tell you what though, if you do do microphones, realize there's different kinds of plugs. I didn't know this. If it's a USB mic, it has a USB plug that plugs into your computer, but there's two kinds of plugs they're 3.5 millimeters there's kind for cameras and there's kind for the computer and they're different lots of the good mics come with adapters but i lost about an hour of filmed footage because i had the wrong adapter in i was using a computer plug when i should have been using a camera plug and just keep that in mind this is something that i learned the hard way i had, I, I just didn't know and i I watched a couple of videos and figured it out. And now we have audio and we've had to switch audio sources because I have so much cable run. We get crackle every once in a while. Uh, the absolute bane of my existence was cable management. Um, I didn't spend much money. Everything I, I borrowed to run the studio, except for adapters. This is what I had to buy. For instance, we had a GoPro that comes out HDMI micro. 
And I had to run that outside about 25 feet. Well, they don't make that kind of cable. So I had to have an adapter to go to HDMI full, run that cable in. Well, then I got to get that cable into the computer and your computers might have an HDMI plug, but that plug is, is an out for a monitor. It's not an in. So I had to then convert it using a capture card. That's in the next slide, I'll talk about it. But I had to change that to a USB-A. And then my computer, Mac, doesn't have a USB-A. So I had to convert that to a USB-C. Uh, it just, it drove me nuts. And now I have it figured out and I just have lots of adapters. And, and when something doesn't work, I have to go along the chain and plug and unplug everything. Uh, if you do use HDMI into your computer, you get a capture card. They can be as expensive, about $200. Don't buy that. Buy the absolute cheap ones. This one's you know less than 20 bucks. And so you have an HDMI in, and then it comes out as a USB. And that little box there converts it from a video file to a digital file, I think. It just does something. And I bought a couple of these, and now I can run all my, computer, all my cameras into OBS, and I can find them, and, and I can switch around. All right, so backgrounds. We started out with a white background, which was okay. Like I said earlier, over Christmas, we bought this vinyl brick wall and it looks great behind us. I'm so happy with that. I think that's the one thing that really improved what we did and just made us feel like we were doing something right. Uh, and then lighting it was, once we understood the lighting theory, it, it worked out pretty good. Um, optional equipment. This is an Elgato Stream Deck. It's about $150 it was absolutely worth its weight in gold. It plugs into your computer. Each one of those buttons is an LCD screen that you can customize. And then the software then allows each button to do, it's essentially a hotkey, but you can do anything you want with that button. And so we have our uh, stream deck, it's right next to us on the, the, the table. I can change all the scenes, I can control the lighting. I don't have a producer. I, I had to do this in a room with just my wife and I. And so this was absolutely saved our life. Um, it's definitely worth it. You can buy them smaller, you can buy them bigger. And they actually have an app now that you can do it on your phone. And so you can have that functionality just for a couple of dollars. We did not go with a, uh, a teleprompter. To me, it was just too hard. I don't like scripts. I just kind of go with it. My wife who works with me, she likes a script and it just didn't make sense to us. So we just tore apart my office, took the monitors, mounted them on a, on a uh, tripod and that's now our uh our um uh, uh what do you call it the <laughs> i can't think of the word um our uh teleprompter and it works you can see it in our eyes but we know it i don't think the kids can see it at all uh so this is what our home screen looks like you can see there's the elgato in the lower left hand corner the clicker for the uh the monitors and in the uh, on the right side there that's that lamp that's a, that illusionary light that kind of looks like it's lighting up everything but it's really doing nothing and then we have a bookshelf just there for transition you can see the scenes we have multiple scenes uh and then sources and it, it's been a really good experience you can see the desk it's kind of marred up uh, i spilled chemicals and things leaked and it was just a lot of fun uh now i'm kind of go through extras that we added uh, this was our countdown scene. So on the bottom, I, I put a link to the video that shows you how to do this countdown within OBS. And so this countdown is what the kids see when they first click on and it runs for two minutes. And when the countdown is over, nothing happens. It's just our timer. But I put a mic on this scene. And so we just kind of talk to the kids. One assembly, we'll pretend like we don't know what we're doing and we're trying to scramble around and we're, we're photocopying things last minute and we'll act like we don't know what's going on. And then another, this sound, science of sound assembly, we, uh, we play different instruments and have the kids try and guess it. Now they're not actually communicating to us, but it's just a nice way to get the kids in the seats, not have to fill time um, because the, the way we have it set up, because we're doing an assembly for a school. There might be 20 teachers there. So we're seeing 20 views on YouTube, which doesn't sound like a lot, but each one of those teachers probably has 20, 25 kids. So there's a multiplying effect. So we, we want to get people ready to go. And this is kind of how we do it. And it, it was really easy once I watched the video. So when you 
when you search on YouTube for how to do something, I like to write down everything step by step as I watch the video. So I pause it, rewind it, and I have a list and then I can carry that list to OBS and I can go through it. And it usually works the first time. And there's lots of different videos on the same topic. So don't just choose one. Uh, we can add in diagrams. So for this scene, uh, we talk about wavelengths and amplitude and we wanted to we added this image in there. So we're actually talking behind it and we can be there pointing at different things on camera, uh, which was really helpful for the kids. This is our chemistry uh, uh, assembly. Uh, so I think that's dry ice and, and hot water. So what we did is the kids, uh, we would show the, the experiment and then we'd talk about the evidence and the kids would kind of have to figure out what evidence proves it's either chemical or physical. And one of the things I wanted to show was temperature because that's really an easy uh, indicator of a chemical reaction. So right to the left of that uh, beaker there, you can kind of see that yellow little square there. That's a, a cheap laser thermometer that I put on a cardboard mount with duct tape and I attached behind it a cheap webcam. And then that webcam I brought in as a source and that's in the lower left-hand corner. So I can shoot something with the laser and I can tell the kids in real time what the temperature is of that uh, reaction was. And so it, it just brought that in and made it real. And then as the temperature changes, it's a little blurry because I couldn't get the camera lined up just right. It was one of those things where I got it going and I just, it worked, so I, I just left it alone. Um, this is an overhead view we have. Like I said, we have lots of cameras. So this is where we, we shake the, the slinky to show them the wavelength. Uh, you can see the blue tape there, that's masked off so we know what's on camera and what's off camera. And if you look in the, in the lower, uh, lower uh, part of the picture, that little T shape, that's a little block for me so I know where to stand. So I, I'm off camera if I have to fiddle with it. Uh, and we did that behind it so we knew where to stand off camera. And, and that was fun to learn too. That's, that's a lot of the, the like video management that I just didn't, didn't know. This is our outside scene. This is where I had to run the cable because some of the stuff we did, I didn't want to make a mess inside. So this particular scene, that hose down at the bottom, if you spin that hose really fast like I'm doing now, it makes a musical note. Uh, and I couldn't do that inside, I'd knock everything down. Uh, and then what we wanted to do is we wanted to show the kids that the more air you move through that hose, the different, the higher pitch the note will become. And I can't spin this fast enough. So we planned it out and about a month before the actual episode, we filmed ourselves doing this reaction in the car. And so we set it up. So I'm live. So here I'm live. And then I stop and then the camera view changes, but that's now the recording and I have to wear the same outfit for you know 20 days to do this right. And then this is a video that plays and the kids think it's live and we kind of did the angle so it looks like it's live. And we drive around making different noises in the hose. And then to end it, we just thought we'd be really silly. So I get a speeding ticket and we talked to the police beforehand and they knew about it and they, give us a fake ticket. And it was just a lot of fun. And this is what the kids talk about. This is all they talk about when they see me. Oh, you got a speeding ticket. And I have to explain, no, no, not really. It was just us being fun. But th that's what they remember. And it was, just, it, was it, it was tons of fun. And like I said, if I can be an idiot to engage a kid on Zoom, uh, that's what I'll do. I don't mind. Uh, this is another outside camera. We did uh, chemical reactions. So those are film canister rockets. And we did picture in picture here because the cameras we were using just didn't show how awesome it was to ignite 300 film canisters at the same time. And so we did a picture in picture there of a close up so they can see it popping and they can see how high they go. Um, and I still don't think it did justice to it. Uh, those are just uh, Alka-Seltzer and water on a table and we have the table spin so it mixes the two and then they pop like popcorn and it was a mess, but again, it was fun. Uh, this is our ending scene. So when we shut down, we turn off the stream from YouTube and then we have to, or, I'm sorry, from OBS. And then we have to end the broadcast on YouTube and we were cutting ourselves off because there's about a seven second delay from OBS to YouTube. So we created this scene. It's a background scene. I made the text scroll up. There's an e easy way to make text move. 
Uh, and so this kind of gives us a couple minutes to just shoot the breeze, talk about what went wrong. The kids kind of get a behind the scenes look of what we're doing. And then when the, the credits end, then I shut everything down. And if the credits get cut, I really don't care because they saw all of this. Um, that's kind of a, a behind the scenes look of, of the adventure we went on. My education was nothing in October. And now it's, there's a lot of holes. Uh, and I appreciate going to these kind of trainings because I, I learned a lot. The link right there is a bit.ly. I'll put that in the chat. But if you want to see our, our shows, I did, you know, like we did the chemical one 20 times. So I finally found one that we made no mistakes in and that's the one there. And then you can see the science of sound. If you wanna see that, um, you can watch that at the end. And if you have any questions, email me, ask me now. I'll be happy to, to do what I can um, to, to help you out. And I just kind of wanted to share with you kind of what we've, what we've done. Any, anything I can help you with? Any questions? Oh, how do you do scrolling text? Um, okay, I'll tell you what I, 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 uh, what I ended up doing is I YouTubed how to make text scroll in OBS. And I watched the video. And so when you get to the text menu, there's actually, that's one of the, sources you can pick is text and then if you just scroll down in that menu you type in your text in a, in a little window and then there are options and one of them is scrolling and you can make it go up down left right speed and all that i just made it go up really slowly so i and i hope that helps you i don't have obs on this computer so i, I wouldn't be able to go in there how do you set off 300 film canisters at the same time so we had a table and I screwed in all the lids. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So there, there it is on, um, on, on, um, on that screen, on Mark's screen. So I, I, I screwed down 300 lids and I had to put a grid. So I did them evenly. And then uh, we, it's on a, uh, if you think of a whiteboard table that kind of rotates like this, I mounted it so it could spin. And so I have, the film canisters upside, the lids upside down, screwed in. And then uh, I took the film canister, I fill it up with, I think, 10 milliliters of water. And then I took half inch PVC pipe and I set that in the water. And so the top of the pipe is dry. And then I very carefully set the, the Alka-Seltzer on top of that. I plug them in from the bottom. And this is, it, it is exhausting on your back. I clip them in one at a time till I have 300 and then I flip them all at the same time and it goes from there. Uh, how do you keep audio in sync with your video? Oh, that's a big problem. We're a little bit out of sync, but the, uh, the video quality and the screen the kids are watching on, it's a little off and I, I just, I, I kind of live with it. I know there is an option where if you go into advanced settings within the, uh, with the sound mixer, you can delay the audio by milliseconds. And I haven't played with that because I'm just living with what I got. It's just, it's as good as I can get it. Okay. Yeah, okay, there, Mark's showing you how to scroll the text. Mark, I figured it out. I'm so <laughs> jealous. Uh, I, I can I can talk about the scrolling text if you want, Mark. It's up to you. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was just playing around while we was listening. You taught me something new. Yeah, isn't that? It, I just love that. I learned all this stuff. So here's the link to my presentation. If you want it, uh, you can just click that, grab it, um, and and then you can go from there. But I, I really appreciate just having a community to talk to and and learn all these little silly stuff. So thanks. And I'll turn this one over now. Let me unmute. You guys can hear me now. Um, yeah, uh, that was awesome. Thank you, Mark uh, and Sean. That was humongous. Uh, you guys talked about, you covered a whole bunch of stuff. Um, when we went through this, we kind of had like a pre-meeting and we're like, what are, what are we all going to talk about? And they both jumped on stuff and I was sitting here like, well, I guess I'll talk about green screen. Um, that's an easy one. And then whenever I sat down to write this, I was like, oh, it's actually way too easy. Almost, almost just really, really too easy. So the good news is you guys asked really good questions and um, I can help answer them. So 
Um, the scrolling text was one of them that I'll try to cover quickly after I go over the green screen. And then there was also a question from Carol, and she said, how do you keep audio in sync with your video? Uh, OBS has something um, like a feature in it where you can delay sound and video. So uh, depending on what your problem is that you're having, you can fix that. But I do think that most of us probably live with, just because it's 2020, well, 2021 now, the pandemic, we just accept like, hey, you get in a Zoom call, half of you are going to have a little bit of a delay somewhere. Video's delayed, audio's delayed. So, I mean, if it's not too bad, it's not, not a big deal. But I can show you some tricks uh, later that, that might help with uh, audio delay. Um, anyway, I, I need to share my screen. I also have to juggle a whole bunch of stuff. I have a ridiculous setup to um, show you guys stuff. So let's share my screen. Okay, you guys see my OBS and me? Good, perfect, fantastic, okay. Uh, so uh, this is my OBS. I just started with something really simple. I watched Adam's guide and I was like, well, I'll start with something that everybody is uh, familiar with. Um, and, and then just add a few things. Uh, in the meantime, I want you to ignore this producer camera that I have here. This is just a secondary camera that I have set up for the sake of if something goes wrong for this. Um, and the color you can see, this is, the C920, it's not not a very, the dynamic is not good compared to the DSLR that we're using that's hitting my face or for sure. Anyway, so to get your green screen going, you obviously need to have a green screen. I wish so much that OBS had a virtual background filter like, like Teams, like Zoom, and so many of the others, but there's not anything free that I felt comfortable sharing with you guys. There are some things, but they felt a little bit fishy, and I was like, this is just too much. And for most of you, if you're here to watch a, a workshop, you probably don't want to get into too much nitty gritty to deal with fixing that. So uh, I'm not going to show you any of those, but I can tell you at the end, if we have time, some of the workarounds that you can do to get a green screen, depending on what you want to use OBS for. If you're just doing a, a virtual field trip or a virtual planetarium show, then um, using a green screen, the most simple way, I can show you guys that right now, it is so easy. So uh, I have added uh, into um, a scene, uh, we're just gonna call this full camera scene for now. Uh, inside of that, I have my camera. Um, we're ignoring this producer camera. This is me, if I move it around, you guys can see I'm kind of shifting a little bit. This is just my direct camera. Uh, right clicking it, clicking filters, we have two windows here in the filters. We have audio and video filters. I honestly have only used this for audio filters. I know it says video filters, but uh, most of these are not anything that I have used for audio. A lot of these are really, really helpful though. If you're in a noisy room, you can add all kinds of noise things to, to audio uh, inputs. And uh, I can tell you that in other offices and at home, that noise filter is humongous for me. Um, however, under the effect filters, uh, we can click the plus sign to add an effect. This is going to be way too easy. You're just going to click chroma key, which just, that's the name for it. We can leave the name basic and you guys can see immediately my background disappears. And this applies to the source in particular. So uh, this camera source I have dropped in other scenes. So uh, here's my scrolling text. Um, which we'll get to that later, and then a presentation. So we're, we're going to do the presentation. I'm going to add some stuff to it. I'm going to go ahead and add um, a video capture device. We can add that the existing camera that we have here. And now I'm, I'm back. I have appeared. And then I'm going to add um, a media source. So actually, yeah, let's do a media source. So if you've got a video, cool video you want to show some people, you can add it in here. And then we're just gonna leave that name. You guys know how to do this. You've seen this before. So here's a video that I made that is just the earth spinning and looping. It's kind of neat. Feels like I'm on a news channel. They have a, a, a earth behind them. Uh, and this, because it's looped, the important part that I skipped over there is uh, when adding it or under properties, you have to turn on loop or it will just end you can increase the speed. All these other things are really, really helpful. Green screen. This is a quick 
solution for this, super easy. Don't forget when doing this, you definitely have to remember your layers and position of things. Um, otherwise, you, you run into weird stuff. This is a good example. That looks kind of awkward. But I do think Adam covered a lot of this um, in terms of uh, how important layers are. Now, uh, Mark brushed over this. Um, and he did mention it was important, but I want to mention it again. So let's just say I get into this scene and I fix my camera the way I like it and I, it looks good on me and I'm happy with the way it looks, but I notice something is wrong in this particular view of the camera and I fix it. So let's just say, um, hey, I don't like it that this is not showing me a mirror view. You can see the text on my shirt. That was a good example, wrong side. But it's really annoying if I'm gonna try to point to a star, I'm doing it opposite, it's, it's mirrored. You can fix that by going here to filters and uh, you can just go ahead to transform and you can flip it horizontally. And now when I raise my right hand, it's in the right place. Everything feels so much more normal if I'm trying to follow something around. It just feels better. However, if I switch to another scene, you guys see that I, I flipped back around and that is really annoying to me. It's, it's very frustrating. Whether you're fixing something, well, another great example is uh, if I want to crop my camera view and, and I do, like Mark mentioned, you hold down the Alt key and you're going to click and drag. If I want to crop something out, uh, maybe the camera is too low and you guys can see something on, on my desk, like a monitor. I have several monitors up here. Um, and then I move to the next source. I've got it fixed just right. I actually have to go into the next scene and recrop that all over again. And that is super obnoxious. So I'm going to show you guys my personal favorite trick, and that is to just not use cameras like that, just like Mark did, where it's called nesting. We're just going to nest them. So what he did is uh, all I can suggest. We're going to just undo what I just did. That was unfortunate. Camera. I misspelled that. It's not important. And then we're going to use my camera. These. Ignore all these names. I have a whole bunch of sources in here for other things that we do. My camera is back. And then let's turn on chroma key. <clears throat> so you guys can see this happen one more time. Video effects filters. Uh, all I do is click chroma key. That's done. You can see around me here. And then in all my other, I'm going to go ahead and add a scene. And we'll add full camera scene. Move that down to the bottom. And you guys can see here, I'm going to delete this for now. Uh, and you can input this into all of them. So any changes you make here, for instance, maybe your lighting in there is, is awful and you look, um, you know, like this and you need to fix that lighting. Uh, you can actually go into filters and add an effect filler, filter, color correction, and uh, you can change the way you look. So. Um, I'm way too green here. Uh, we can try to shift that hue a little bit. Um, and it's going to apply to every scene after that. That's, that's not what we're going to do here, though. So uh, a different, different thing. And you can add these, and it will show up for each one of your scenes. Uh, really, in my opinion, it's a must-have. Set your camera one time. You don't ever mess with it again. And uh, you're good to go. And this. Chroma key will work as you add the scene over and over again to more and more scenes, as many as you need to add, and you can keep using it, super convenient. But since we have a little bit of time left, I do want to take a moment to uh, go over that, that text. So uh, we'll start here with just a simple one. To get scrolling text, uh, you can just uh, add a source. I did that a little bit fast. We're going to do text GDI plus. I don't think they have the old text stuff. There used to be some um, previous ones. We're going to call this credits. Um, you can read from file, so if you have like a, a notepad file, it will, it will pull from there. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to say Jim, and then I'm just going to copy pasta that over and over again. And let's, let's actually mess some of these up so you guys can see changing. Um, you don't need to do anything else, which is kind of nice. I guess this vertical feature allows you to make it that's horizontal, what I would say, but whatever. Um, you can change font, 
color. When you open up the select font, it gives you this huge tool to choose from lots of different things uh, that you might typically see when editing uh, text. It's not moving. That's okay. You're going to right click on it and you're going to go to filters and then effect filter. There's one that says scroll right here. If you're seeing this move on my screen and you're not seeing it, there might be additional. I have a bunch of plugins and stuff installed, so I honestly can't tell you what's a plugin and what's not. Um, but uh, scrolling and then you change. If you want it to go horizontally, you can move this vertically. We're just going to move vertically, I don't know, 100. Uh, make sure loop is selected so it loops. If you don't want it to, that's fine too. These limit width and limit height just allows you to limit the width of them. Uh, so I guess we could put like 800. You guys can see all of it. That seems weird, weird choice. But uh, that was really neat use of that. I don't think I've used the scrolling credits before. Um, if a lower thirds, you want to have a ticker or something in the bottom, I guess this would be a fantastic way to do it. Uh, but either way, super interesting. Uh, and I don't want to hold you guys too long. So uh, we have uh, some questions here. Uh, Jim, what are you using for the screen behind you? Um, Ron, we just bought, and I can try to find a link on Amazon. We just bought a large green screen. So uh, if I turn this off, I'm going to go to filters here and then just hide the chroma key and close that. It is just a really large, I think it's probably 15 by uh, 10 or something close to that. It's it's pretty big. Fortunately, we have a nice little open area in the planetarium, so we didn't have any problems with um, moving stuff around. One thing I wanted to mention that's important for the green screen stuff, um, under these filters and the, and the chroma key, there's all these tools here. Um, similarity, smoothness, key color spill reduction, opacity, contrast, brightness, uh, once you get to opacity, I think most of you guys know what these are. They're pretty simple, straightforward. Uh, opacity is going to make me um, see through. We need to turn this on um, a little bit. So if there is something behind me, you would uh, would see through it. Let's go down here to this. Yeah, you can see through me. I look a little ghostly. This could be a fun um, Halloween tool, I suppose. You want to be a ghost. But it makes sense. Contrast, brightness, all that stuff is exactly what you'd imagine it to be. Uh, similarity uh, allows the color to be a little more custom. So um, if you wanted it to grab more, if you had poor lighting, if I turned off some of my lights, we're fortunate here to be able to afford. When I saw Sean going through all of his lists, I was like, man, if only we could afford all of those tools. <laughs> uh, and good for you, Sean, but we're fortunate to have two lights to light the green screen. If I would turn one off, you guys can see what, uh, why this comes into play. So I'll turn this this green screen uh, or that light off and uh, let's hide chroma key for a moment. You can see that it is now much darker on this side. And uh, that's when similarity is going to uh, help a lot because you may, if you have something bright behind you, so for effect, we'll add an image. Um, we're going to call this green screen. And uh, I, I have, this is what I use for testing. This is essentially what Adam did in the previous one. He just, I just used a green screen, green uh, made a big blob and I use it for testing purposes. Oh, that's just slightly in the way. Um, and just to test the way the green screen looks. So dragging that around, or you could, I guess I could blow it up full screen. You can see multiple places at once. You can see that this is a bad area right here. Um, and that similarity might help get rid of it. I just turned the similarity up just a little bit um, and it, it removed the problem with it. If we pull it back, you guys can see that fixing it. That really helps with that. The catch, if you turn this up too high, is that more colors are too similar and eventually it will eat you. And this is, this is actually terrifying. We're gonna default this away. We don't wanna mess with that. Um, uh, smoothness is another thing that you only really want to use if you've got not perfect lighting or or whatever. It, it does a similar thing. So uh, the smoothness, if I turn um, the similarity down just a little bit so that we can accentuate this problem uh, in here, the smoothness is going to try to take this, it's kind of blocky. I, I want to call it blurkity. That's the term that I use. It, it's going to want to take the blurkity and make it a little bit more smooth. 
And it does a pretty good job of that if I turn that up. But also anything that goes in that area can disappear or can blend in with the green screen pretty bad. So you have to be careful when turning these up. There's a catch always. Uh, there's smoothness up again. It also looks kind of out of control. Key color spill reduction. This is a big one. If you have a green screen and you raise your hand, you guys can see me um, in the filter window or really either. If I start shaking my hand back and forth, you can see green around the outside of my fingers. And this is such a small problem to have, but I'm sure that there are many of you are like me. And if something doesn't look exactly the way I want it to, I'll get hyper-focused and I'll just lose my mind trying to solve the problem. Um, a key color spill reduction can help with that just a little bit. But if you turn that up too much, it pulls out lots of green and that means color. So you can see that you lose a little bit. And while you don't see the green, it still, the, the effect is still there. So uh, it depends on your situation. And I do want to say when we do the breakout rooms, which is soon, reach out to me if you've got a green screen, you got problems. Just like Mark, just like Sean said, please email me. I would, I would love to try to help and get everybody's studio set up working the way you want it to. Um, I'm really happy with what we have here. I'm not going to go through and show you all my cool features like Sean did, but it was important. I think once you went through um, uh, Adam's presentation and you've seen a little bit of uh, what Mark and Sean did, the question becomes less, um, you know, what do I do or, or how do I do it, but more, what do I do? So what do you want to do to make your presentation awesome? And seeing how crazy Sean went with cameras is just, <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Uh, Anyway, uh, we, we can hand it over to questions if you guys have them now. Um, I mean, that's really all I have, and we don't have too too much time left, I don't think. so. Jim, if I can add, we went to a fabric store and bought a couple yards of the lime green uh, fabric, and we hung it like a curtain with a curtain rod, maybe spent $60. That's and, what we're doing. Yeah, and it just it worked so good. And I thought the wrinkles in the curtain would make an issue, and it doesn't. I do know, and I, I, I don't have them, but they make green screens that attach to the back of just your chair. And it's kind of that same thing that, you know, those pop-up window screens that you put in your car window, it kind of looks like that with that, and you can twist it and make it a smaller circle. They make them with just a little uh, strap that straps just behind your camera. So you just have green screen around you. And then when you put the background behind it, it becomes whatever you want it to be. And I thought that was yeah. just a really easy idea. I want to say that Michael McConville had something like that. Small, they, they make small ones um, that, that are pretty clever. But yeah, essentially, it's just a big piece of green fabric that we have. Let me ruin my camera shot. And you guys can see a little bit of what we have going on. So you can see pretty quickly when I get off the green. Let me drag this over here. You can see the clips hanging out. The fabric is not perfectly straight. <laughs> All that comes into view whenever I break our, our careful camera alignment. Anyway, uh, yeah, and we have uh, any other questions? We're open to it. And if we want to do breakout rooms, uh, that's totally fine. If not, it seems like there's just a few of us left. Yeah, we've, had, we've lost some people along the way. It uh, got to be very late in Europe. So <laughs> I know some of those folks are getting really tired. There's a lot of information. I'm trying to absorb it all. Yeah, definitely. I, that was something I was scared of doing was just throwing out so much stuff that, um, I mean, there's really silly ways that you can um, cheat a green screen without buying one that I didn't mention. I just thought were, would be too much. Uh, one of those was using that um, producer camera here. I just delete that filter that I added. Um, you could use one camera in, in Zoom if you were recording, if you were going to use this to record. Um, you could use one camera in Zoom and then use Zoom's virtual background to add a green image behind you. And then you could, like we watched Mark do, you could do a, a screen capture um, and capture your Zoom view in a green screen, which is just super obnoxious and kind of convoluted, but it works, <laughs> I promise. 
Carolyn uses a green blanket. I know my coworker Kyle has just a whole set of eight and a half by 11 green paper taped up behind his, his studio at home. Oh, Carol, um, you can get it to work uh, for sure. So mm. uh, at home, we had like a teal colored wall at my house and it, it had texture on it, which I was really worried about. And it was uh, like a semi gloss. So I was, there was a lot of things that I was like, I don't know if it'll work, but um, I can share my screen to show you this. This is really, really cool and super helpful again. Um, yeah, yeah, share, share, share. Okay, uh, so let me move this out of the way. And um, under uh, camera on filters, uh, chroma key, you could use chroma key here and uh, it's key color type. You could click custom and then select color this opens up this window. And then the last thing you could do is actually pick a screen color. So if you had, for instance, chroma key turned off, uh, let's turn it off here and then come back to this. And let's just say my green screen, I bought it off Amazon and I was like, yes. And it came and it was not the color that I expected. It was like an off green. You can just grab this little screen color pick from any color on here and it will try to to key it out. So I just chose my face. Um, I have no idea what this will actually, it just, similarity was too high. Um, there we go. And that keys out just me. That's kind of ridiculous. But you can use that custom tool, Carol, to, um, to pick up just about any color you wanted to. I use two beach towels, a <laughs> cheap old coat rack. <laughs> uh, I gotta, gotta stay cheap. Most of the stuff that we used um, was personal. I, I had a camera link to, uh, to film that was mine at home. This thing, crazy expensive. When I bought it originally, it was like 120 bucks. And I, I do have to echo what Sean said. They have uh, cheap ones on Amazon for $20. Works just as well. And, and so well that I would say, I mean, you could break five of those and buy, you know, like, hey, I ended up going through four of them before I got one that worked and still pay less than what this one costs. So it just seems like a, don't be scared to not buy Elgato or something from a name brand like Corsair that you're, you're comfortable with. Those, the cost difference is too high. All right, everything else, I mean, you guys have questions. There's so much to OBS. It's like really detailed. That countdown thing that Sean showed um, is, a, is a script. So uh, under tools uh, in your OBS, I guess I don't have that shared. That was really cool. Um, uh, he does a, uh-oh, did I share the wrong one? Yeah, we don't, you guys don't need to see that. I don't know exactly how uh, Sean did it, but the countdown that I use is, is a script um, here. And I actually don't have it loaded. I'd have to go and load it, but you can, you can Google. I, I'll have to get a link for that. I certainly wasn't prepared to bring it up, but um, you can Google um, countdown script OBS and then only get it from OBS project uh, website. Uh, that's really nice. Which scene transitions are best? Um, Adam did bring that up. It, am I, am I wrong on that? Adam, you brought up the scene transitions in yours. I thought you did. Um, it's certainly what you like. I personally love fade something that, that doesn't, I didn't see brought up. Maybe Adam didn't do it just to relax on the information is using studio mode. I, I always stay in studio mode. I didn't want to do it here cause I thought it would be, maybe it would be confusing if I'm changing one and it's not updating on the other but this is super nice to get stuff ready. So for instance, if I'm doing a field trip, a virtual field trip, we're fortunate to have two staff and I can prepare things for Levent to try to deal with. And he doesn't see this screen. He just sees himself on Zoom and I can surprise him with all kinds of things. I've, I've stretched him into a thin piece of spaghetti for the kids as he's going into a black hole. I've you know, I'll put fireworks on the screen, SpongeBob, lots of stuff that I probably shouldn't do for a live stream because of some copyright reasons. But for a field trip in a classroom, that's reasonable to use. Um, and, and this is the way to do it uh, for sure. Super neat to have things transition 
this is a great example. Um, the logo, you know, you can change everything over here and it doesn't update to your live feed, which is on the right hand side. And then you could slowly fade it in. The other thing that uh, I see people do that I also really like, um, it's certainly something that I do is uh, media source. You can add lower thirds. That are really convenient. I, I have one here. Uh, this is a, a video version. Its file is WebM. That's kind of, I would say, wild. Maybe you might see that and think, you know, like, why would you choose that? But it's a really small video format file. That's why I do. So um, it doesn't use a lot of CPU usage. You can track that in OBS down here uh, if it's tiny. So here's this. I just I just threw it together in After Effects and uh, rendered it out with the alpha channel so it looks pretty good. Uh, and it will go away here shortly also. Should. And that's convenient. Uh, but this is the same concept as adding a video or even a logo. I just chose media instead of an image. Uh, I always do MP4, Carol. Um, I don't know why I do it. I, I think I just, I don't, I, I saw MKV and I was like, the only time I've ever seen MKV is when somebody sends me like videos that were, I, I don't know, some Digistar users, I, if I get videos from them, sometimes it comes as MKV and I'm always like, what is this every time? But I, for me, it's, uh, I don't know what that is, so it must be bad. <laughs> um. I was actually making a recording today and OBS was saying that if you use MKV, if a stream is interrupted, it, it won't lose the whole video. But if you switch over to MP4, that if, if it gets interrupted, it, um, for some reason you, you lose it. Yeah. I, I don't know much more than that, but I did notice that today. I, so I, I mean, it, it depends on what you're doing. I was making a, a one minute video for, something so i wasn't worried about getting getting interrupted but i suppose if you were recording the entire length of this workshop that might become important i don't know i i use mp4 but you're right maybe there's uh, like adam said uh, mkv is for vlc player um i don't know i mean I'm, i assume after effects and premiere can open them uh and you can edit them through that but Actually, both are only envelopes. It's like an envelope where you put an audio stream and a video stream. So uh, you, you can have uh, the video with, a, with the same kind of compression, say H.264 uh, or XVID. It can be both in, X, in um, MKV or MP4. It's... Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's more like an envelope with which has, has some very small differences. The most important thing for OBS or other or other software is the the codec, the the compression you do to the video stream and the audio stream. Of it. The, those are a bit a bit tricky sometimes. So Adam, you put something in about Handbrake. Um, do you want to tell us what that's about? Sure, because uh, Carol wrote in about um, the video file being too big to email. Uh, the The reality is, is that a lot of email servers won't take anything more than 10 megabytes. So regardless, if you have a 10, you know, 1920 by 1080 high def video, even if it's a few minutes, it's probably going to be more than 10 megabytes. Um, Handbrake is free software for any for I think any platform, and I use it a lot. Where um, it 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 ha it has like uh, you you can change settings, but it's designed to compress and convert. And so even when I'm doing our professional videos that we put to our YouTube, and I go through professional software and I make an mp4 file as an example well by golly it's usually huge I'll just run it through handbrake and it'll be sometimes a third the size but almost no difference in quality 
it can be a little bit less in quality, but I mean, you really got to know what you're looking for to even see that, but it makes it, let's say uh, a file is uh, a gigabyte and it'll chop it down to about 350 meg. And even though it's still a big file, it's a lot easier to stream because it's less data per minute or per second. Uh, it's easier to store and all those things. Um, I wouldn't super compress because then the quality drops, but it's free and um, it can do, it is, it's one of those programs that's um, very nice because uh, it's just like, it's a little tool that you can use for a whole bunch of things. Yeah, the high bit rate. Um, you, you have can to just, that in settings, I think. That's a settings thing in OBS and, you, and Zoom also for recording. Yeah. And you have to play with it because I personally don't know. Sometimes the bit rate, you know, just a number is dependent upon the software that's using it as to the quality that you end up getting sometimes. I, I don't know if you've had that experience, but you just have to experiment with something. Yeah, just, you need hey. to drop it to as low a bit rate as you can get it and still have it look good. Um, yeah. But yeah, that whole, what you're saying, Adam, the whole exporting videos is a science in and of itself. <laughs> it is, there's so much depth to what codec yeah. you want to use and so on and so forth for how you're going to use it. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, and if you've ever made deep, you know, way in the Wayback Machine, you, you make DVDs. Like if you want to master a DVD, you can use one of those softwares that uh, programs that does everything for you and that's fine. But I'll tell you, if you pre-process your videos to the exact settings that are necessary for what a DVD needs, I mean, you can get files down to about 10% the size and they'll be better quality because you don't have a, all that overhead of, I don't know what, but stuff, just stuff you don't need um, when, when going through those programs. And it's the same kind of thing. And just experiment, you know? Um, and uh, Sean, you were correct about the 720p thing. Because you're broadcasting 720p, there's no reason to be sourcing at higher resolutions. It, it, um, it, you just, there's no reason. Yeah, everything worked so much better when I dropped everything down. And the frame rates, uh, the frames per second, I dropped those down. And it just, I, I was really surprised, having never done this before, I was surprised that decreasing the quality made it better. Yeah. Yeah, because your if your computer or software just can't handle it at the rate, you're going to drop frames. It's going to be a mess. It's the same in the theater if you're doing, let's say, full dome. You know, if you have the quality so high, the the frame rate so high, even your system won't handle it, and it's going to, yeah. you know, be a mess. And but you don't go too low where then the image falls apart. But there's there's that sweet spot where it's designed to work right. Definitely, definitely. Uh, there are other cool things that we didn't mention that I think are really big for like high quality streams and uh, transitions are one of them. Learning to make your own stingers or transitions is huge. If you have any experience with uh, video editing, then it's, it's really not hard to do. If, you, if you've used something like After Effects, making your own stinger is it just takes, in my opinion, the quality goes from boring, just simple fade to the next scene to, wow, that's spectacular. You know what you're doing. Um, and taking advantage of low, small size, um, low bit rate, little video clips, um, just little things that just take your, your whole stream to a, a total other um, level. Yeah, the, the stingers are something that I really want to focus on. And that, that I got that that idea from the video game streamers. They use those all the time when they're playing Call of Duty and they something happens and they want to highlight that and sound effects. And it's just it I never knew that world existed. And it's it was kind of cool to watch what they were doing. And then you compare it to what the churches are doing 
and you kind of get both sides and it's like, wow, there's some really good stuff out there. Uh, agreed. Taking advantage of all the stuff that people had on YouTube. I think that was a huge thing. We talked about this was um, once you watched Adams, I felt like if you, if you watched Adams, you really just needed somebody to tell you, this is how you need to search for this on the internet. Adam, you did such a great job of giving a like concrete area to stand on for everyone that it was like, wh what do we talk about? Because once you've, somebody took away the mask of a scary program, it's just, how do I use it at this point? So yeah, searching for things. Yeah, I'll second that. Um, I have a quick question for Sean. Do you think you're gonna continue making these assembly videos even when life returns to normal? Yeah, so um, we're going to tear this studio down in about two weeks, and I'm really excited to get rid of the cables that I have, and we're going to reset it up in an office, and I, as far as I know, we're going to be normal next year, so we do, like every two weeks, we'll do a STEM night for a school, and they'll come to us, and I think that's going to be one of the rotations, and I'm, I'm planning to have a studio and have my high school volunteers run it, and so each each STEM night is going to become like an episode. And so they'll produce like a, an intro and then we'll have kid interviews and then we'll, we'll like tour the, 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 our facility. And then we'll have kids read science news or they'll do weather broadcasts on a green screen. And then I think we can just throw that to YouTube and give the parents the link and, and make the, I think we have to make YouTube then private so no one else can see it. And, and so every, every STEM night will be a produced video that goes with it. And I'm just so amazed at how cheap this stuff is, how good quality it is. I mean, stuff that five years ago was thousands of dollars is, is hundreds. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah. That's cool. All right, so we have a recommendation for PTZ Optics for streaming sessions and books too. That's good to know. We have just a few more minutes before I have to um, get off the Digitalis Zoom account and let somebody else use it. So more questions for our hosts. Yeah, uh, oh, I, did, I missed that, Ron. The, does o, OBS, I assume you mean OBS, have a telestrator? You mean like a teleprompter style thing? Is that, is that what you're asking? Hmm. Maybe I don't know what a telestrator is. No, have you ever watched a football game? They freeze the frame and then they draw arrows on who's going where and circle oh, people. Oh, um, you could probably set one up. You could, you could, oh, that, that's, that's really, really good point. You could probably set, you'd need tools to do it though. You'd, you'd need some kind of tablet to write on. Um, but I, I do believe it's possible. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, my, I have a Surface book that, that's like my personal laptop that I use and it has functionality with the pen where I could immediately take a screenshot and start writing on it. Um, and that is something you could probably fiddle into OBS with a little bit of effort and get it to work if you have a computer like, like that to use. Yeah, I don't. Um, I have a, a PC, which is a box that sits on a desk. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, hop in the time machine and check on the early, early 80s. It's something like that. Oh, I can't talk to these kind of people. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Are your discs floppy? Thanks, thanks for reaching down. <laughs> no, they're the kind that are hard plastic when you know, so they don't. Oh, the ones, the ones in. that they they made look like the save button on our on our uh, five and a quarter. Our, yeah. Oh, I wondered why they modeled that after a save button. That was a weird choice. Hey, it wasn't a weird choice thirty years ago. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I, I, I saw something on the internet about uh, somebody, uh, a kid in a classroom finding a, an old 3.5 floppy and saying, hey, this looks like the save button. That's cool, you 3D printed a save button. I thought that was such a hilarious moment to think about. Yeah, I'm sure, go on YouTube and how to have a touch screen work with OBS, and I'm sure someone's done it. it I got to imagine that there's video game streamers out there that that make money by just drawing on their screen. It's gotta be out there. That's a really good question. Um, I can kind of think how it would be done, but how it's actually done, I don't know. Well, I think you could probably, if you had a, a camera above a whiteboard and just chroma key out the surface of the whiteboard yeah. and yeah. use a pen, yeah, it's got enough contrast, but you know, to have your video there 
and have your hand here, you know, you, that's going to be a little practice. So rather than writing I, on the screen where I could just reach up and circle Jim's face, I have to understand where on the whiteboard Jim's face is or, oh, I got to make it over here a little bit more. Nope, this, nope, nope, nope. I got to already start off. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a feeling that if you have a tablet that, that you could draw on, you could do it really quickly just by having a green background and not using any green colors, I bet it would be really simple to get started. Um, I don't have those tools, at least not in an easy way to use, but. All right. I'm going to go home and try it. <laughs> That's a great idea. Use a Sharpie on the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> single use monitor <laughs> just make make sure to make sure it's a dry erase not a permanent i will say adam your your solution to a green screen where you just you just cropped out you just dropped that over i'm telling you i saw that and i was like i think that could be better than a green screen in so many situations hmm. um that the was only, incredible the only thing i don't like about it is that there's still the frame there's a circle or square or whatever, as opposed to floating, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Neat though. I, I, I never even, I've actually used the tool before, but only to like lop off the corners of my video or something. I did. I don't know why it didn't dawn on me that I could just make a circle and, and move my head around an OBS to point at stuff. I, that's just, that's incredible. I don't have a green screen at home. So, it's, you know, it's one of those things. I just, it took me a long time to figure that out. It really did. Well, yeah, it was huge. I felt like this, Let's see if this will well, work. Yeah, look, this is my office at home and this is actually the container. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah, this thing is actually a, a reflector, a photo reflector for photography. And so it's got black and white and gold, but there's no green, of course. Mm -hmm. And I have it sitting on, oh, of course you can't see it. Um, the stand that is holding uh, a photo light that's shining up on the ceiling. So I have a bounce, which is why my head is so bright. <laughs> um, but I'm facing the corner inside of the desk space. And so there's no way I could get proper lighting in here. And then I, I have this under lighting and then I have this, it's too strong and it doesn't balance. So this ends up being better. I wanted to- One of those fancy little, uh, I haven't tried, I've thought about it so many times, but at most planetariums that I've been to, they have those nice little arm lights. It's just a single LED. I wonder how well that would yeah. work in a tight space like that because it is so movable. Yeah, but then it's a pin light. And so you're going to have to diffuse it. Use one, then you got a harsh shadow. And that's the whole lighting thing that uh, that Sean brought up. Yeah. Yeah. I think he had, he's not here. Um, but, um, and yeah, lighting's important. I, I was just going to throw this out because this is more in, you know, in the intermediate advanced level of discussion. The other one was, on, I, I purposely did not include a lot of stuff on the other one because there's, you, you don't want to make it more complex. Um, I was trying to use my uh, mirrorless camera for a better image. And of course, my internet is so bad that it didn't matter. And it was so complex to sync the audio and the video and then going through everything because it's not a webcam, it's a regular camera. But I also learned about LUTs, L-U-T. I don't know if any of you have messed with that. And that was kind of nice because a LUT is, it's like an adjustment filter that you adjust. You have to do it manually and, you know, takes time to do it. But then, oh, if I'm using this camera with this lighting, I apply the LUT, snap. Everything balances and it looks great because you've spent the time. And all you do is you get an, an original LUT. It's a square image, which looks like it's like, um, like a jealousy window or like levers, louvers, all these triangles on it. So you get one that's an original that's not modified. 
then you do a screenshot or like a camera snap of the camera you're using. Let's say it's of, it's of yourself. You take a picture, put that into something like Photoshop, and then do whatever settings you do to get it just right. And then do the same exact settings, copy those uh, filters and adjustments you've done, no matter how much you did, apply it to that original LUT, and then save that as your adjustment, the LUT for that camera. And then in OBS, under filters um, with the camera, you can apply a LUT. You can apply a LUT. And you and it's all it is is just like a JPEG image or PNG or mm -hmm. something, because what you're doing is adjusting that image with all of those settings that you did, and then the software that reads a LUT can see the difference between what's original and what that one is. And uh, professional videographers use that because it's that you, they have a LUT that's specific for the camera. So like, oh, I'm using the, you know, the Panasonic video camera. I'll just apply that LUT and all of a sudden the color balance is right. And it removes a lot of labor because it's already been adjusted for that camera. Because every camera responds. Look at all the videos of all of us you, right now. Uh, Adam, what, what were you using to hook up your, um, your mirrorless camera? Did you just use a USB and Sony's little webcam utility? Oh, sorry. Cam link. Um, the camera, because I have the, a Sony A7 II, I was using the Sony software that does the uh, live control and the live the feed. Kind of low. No, it's actually excellent. The quality really? is good. I can't, I, either, it, if I'm using 6400 or 6100, the frame rates are just, so they're kind of like, I don't know, oh. jerky. Um, I don't know. Um, Maybe it's my computer. I was able to I get a, it. The stream computer is garbage, so. I, I, I had a clean signal, um, but I had to do a display capture, so I didn't add another two-second delay. And um, so that's tricky because you can't have anything on top of a, what you're display capturing because it'll display whatever's on the cap on capture what's ever on the display. Mm -hmm. And I also made this jig. <laughs> that mounts up in the desk right here. Oh, that's beautiful. And I don't know if you can see it. This is a wet is a wedge, this piece, so mm -hmm. that it angles the camera down. Mm -hmm. This took me hours to make so that <laughs> I could just mount it and then the camera was right on me. And of course I'm not using it because it's because I don't I have the bandwidth to send it out. It was and it was just so difficult. Well, I hate, I hate to step in here, but I'm, I'm going to have to hand over the Digitalis account. So, um, but that was a, that was a cool thing to end with. Adam does a lot of custom things that um, are, are really interesting. He's, he's good at building things like comet models and <laughs> jigs for his cameras. And uh, it's always impressive. Cool. Well, we lost Sean. He had to go wrangle some fifth graders, but um, we, I thank him and Jim and Mark for putting this all together. And um, the folks we still have here, thanks for joining us. And um, I'm saving the recording and the chat, and I will post probably on Monday about where those are located. So I'm going to stop recording now and say thank you. So I'll see you all later. Bye. Yep. Thank you, Bye, Mark everybody. and Sean.